Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Lincoln Community Church. We're so thankful that you're here with us this morning. You could choose to be anywhere in the world, but you're here with us, ready to worship the Lord. Amen? Amen. Thank you for being here. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, it says, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, and get this, do it with gentleness and respect. In other words, don't beat them over the head. <laughs> Just have gentleness and respect. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we're so thankful to be here this morning, thankful for your congregation that has come out to worship you. Pray that you would give them a mighty blessing today and that they would go home saying it was good to be in the house of the Lord. We pray for our country, pray for the leadership, pray that you would give them wisdom and guidance. And Lord, also the sick, we know that there are so many that are probably here even, that are ailing, that are having difficulties, and those who are not with us this morning, we pray that you would be with them also. Give them peace and comfort. Pray for this service, Lord. We pray that you would meet with us, your Holy Spirit would fill us, and we would sing out and worship you this morning. And especially this morning, we want to pay, pray for Pastor Mike as he delivers your sermon that you have for your people. And then lastly, Lord, sometimes I think we forget this. We come to church and we pray for all these things. You know what we forget sometimes, Lord? We forget that there are people who are lost out there people who don't even know you. We assume everybody that walks through these doors is a Christian. They have a relationship with you, Father, but that's not a good assumption. There may be people in our congregation this morning who are lost, who are seeking. We pray that they would not be lost, that they would find you, that they would find a personal relationship with you this morning before they leave. We ask all of this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. In 1869, Fanny J. Crosby was inspired to write Rescue the Perishing. It's our first song we're going to sing this morning. And I want to just give you a little background. In that first verse, the words in that verse give us six commands to us as Christians. It is rescue, care, snatch, weep, lift and tell those are things i don't know do you know this song how many know this song all five of you okay good all right i was gonna say sometimes we sing this song we don't even know what we're singing all right but there's a lot of good meat gospel meat in these songs if we'll just listen each stanza is followed by a simple refrain rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful. And who's going to do the saving? Jesus will save. Amen. We need to care and rescue and let Jesus do the saving. Let's stand as we sing, rescue the perishing.
know that. But we are in a war against Satan. And I don't know if you know, there's a war going on against religion right now, particularly Christianity. So we need to stand up and fight like soldiers, amen? amen. Let's sing about that. Onward, Christian soldiers. read a poem that I wrote uh, this week. Um, you know, when you're going to introduce a poem, you generally have think about what you're going to say. And uh, this morning, I woke up and I couldn't find my wallet. <laughs> Nothing makes you feel more human when you lose your wallet. <laughs> but that's right where Jesus is, right? In our humanness waiting for us to depend upon him for the smallest of things and the, the greatest of things. So um, anyway, so I have to, I'm still kind of razzled, you know, when you lose your wallet, it's hard to, it's hard to shake it. <laughs> so um, when I was asked to write a this poem about uh, dining with Jesus, I asked, uh, like I often do before I write a poem, Lord, what is it? What is it that you'd like me to write? How, how can I honor you? How can I encourage others when I write this poem? So I thought about the account in the Gospel of John and where they made a dinner for Jesus and Lazarus was at the table with him. And I thought how, how cool that would have been to be there at that table with Jesus. Then I remembered this, uh, when we recognize his presence at our dinner table, he's not somewhere up there when we say grace, but that he is right there in our midst at our table. And so this, after writing this poem, I shared with my wife and daughter, 
um, the poem before we had grace. And I really realized um, and remembered recognizing Jesus is right there at our table. And so um, this, this poem has actually become special to me for that reason. So it's titled Dining with Jesus. We are here to dine with Jesus, so let's hold hands and gather around as we partake in this meal together and in this new life that we have found. And let us recognize his presence. This we simply must insist. For where two or three are gathered, he is there within our midst. For as we dine with Jesus, we never dine alone. And when we recognize his presence and all the goodness he has shown. So let us eat with joy and gladness in the provisions of the day. And let us share with one another all that's happened along the way. As we remember that he is with us in the breaking of the bread, may we nourish one another with all the words he said. For we will dine with him forever with hearts that he's made new. So let us give him thanks together and give him the honor that is due. Thank you, Steve, that was wonderful. And I don't care where you go, what you do, maybe out to eat. Take the name of Jesus with you when you go, amen? Let's sing that together this morning. Take the name of Jesus with you. Thank you. I dumped this on him last week. I think about Wednesday. I said, you know what? I'm, I'm going to talk about dining with Jesus, among other things. Can you write a poem? <laughs> Boy, you did, brother. Thank you. Yeah. Just really blessed me this morning. Welcome, all of you. It's good to see you here this morning. I hope you're all well and healthy and enjoying the Lord. Um, if this is your first time, a special welcome to you. And uh, as Jody always says, Welcome home. <laughs> anyway, we hope this will be your home. Anyway, God bless you. It's great to have you all here today. Hope you take a few moments and sign in and let us know who's here. And especially, if this is your first time, if you might just fill out that little uh, yellow sheet for us, 
We'd love to just send something to you in the mail and greet you in a little more personal way. And uh, don't worry, we won't show up on your doorstep. Uh, we don't do that. Uh, not unless I call you first, you know. <laughs> but uh, seriously, we'd love to just send you uh, a little bit about us and just so you might know just a little bit more who we are here at this church. Well, there are a few things that I want to highlight for you this morning. And uh, these flowers today, the ones over right here are from Margie Bueller's memorial service yesterday. Had a glorious service. It really was very special. And uh, then the flowers right here in front of me, Cindy Jacobs, is presented in honor of her husband who passed away and went home to be with the Lord two years ago. And Cindy, thank you for these flowers. They, they really make the place beautiful. Well, we've got some wedding anniversaries today. And I want to recognize a few of those folks. Jerry and Carolyn Hill, 51 years. We're Jerry, there they are, way in the back. Stand up back there. Oh, well, just wave. God bless you guys. And then uh, Steve and Helen Colburn, 59 years. Wow. Steve and Helen, where are you at? I don't know if I saw them yet this morning. And then uh, last but certainly not least, Art and Diane Deerdorf. So where's Art and Diane? There they are, right there. All right. 15th wedding anniversary. Congratulations to all of you this morning. This morning, after this service, we have a welcome class. And uh, lots of you let us know that you're coming. If you uh, didn't let us know, but you still want to come, after the service, grab a cup of coffee, a cookie, whatever. Go right on through. We're going to be in room 122. We'd love to have you. We have a lunch also afterwards, so uh, we hope that you can come. And uh, we ran into a snag last week. We gave out giving uh, statements to everybody. We do that every year. And suddenly we started noticing in the month of July, just nothing was there. And uh, I noticed it, so I went to our folks and said, hey, it's not there. And Jody noticed he was there, and that's when they knew something was wrong. Somehow the, the uh, database or whoever it is takes, it's not us, it's them. And, <laughs> no, seriously, it is them, it's not us. And uh, we got that all corrected, so what we did was we mailed them all out to you, so you should be getting them in the mail. If you did not get your giving statement in the mail, please let us know, and uh, we'll make sure that you get that. If you don't have a name tag, get one. <laughs> no, seriously, we'd like to, we love you wearing name tags, and you'll notice I didn't wear mine today, I left it at home. Now, now you've got to be forgiving. I think that's the first time in 365 days, whatever, that I left one home. But anyway, um, it really helps. You know, we, uh, we're all getting older, and our brains are not getting slower. They're just getting fuller. Keep that in mind. I mean, if you've got a computer, you know how this works. After that thing has got so much info after a while, it just doesn't move as fast. And that's because it's got so much info in it. And that's the way I prefer to think about it in my mind, you know, that... Uh, Oh, yeah, I know you. So oh, well. The, the guy was up here leading the song. What was your name? <laughs> Seriously, that nothing helps us know each other better than name tags. So if you don't have one, let us know. We'd love to get one for you there. And uh, it, it just uh, it's really helpful, promotes, promotes getting to know each other here in our church. There are several things in the program today. Just take a note of them. One I want to tell you about is in a couple of weeks on the 5th, we have a special movie, The Mulligan. All you golfers know what a mulligan is. And uh, for those of you who don't know what a mulligan is, a mulligan is when you hit a shot and they give you the grace of skipping that shot and trying again. Uh, and uh, some of us take three and four mulligans each time we play. <laughs> anyway, that's a, a neat Christian movie. However, what's really needed is Pat Boone is in it. You will love him. You will love him. Remember Pat Boone? Oh, man, that's, that's a long time ago. But uh, <laughs> you'll love it. It's, it's really great. Now, we, that night, we're going we're gonna to have hot dogs. And uh, so you come. We'd love to have you come. And it will be in the evening at 5 o'clock on the 5th of February. No football games that week. We, you know, originally, we picked the 29th because the Super Bowl is always the first week in February. Uh -uh, not this year. I guess now because they're playing 17 games. Now, it's the second week in February. OK, so that means the first week in February, there's no football games. OK, so you, you can stay home, get a nap. Love to have you come in the evening. It'll be a fun time. Well, 
a lot of other things. Please take, take an opportunity to note them. Um, please be in prayer. Take it on our, our, our prayer list. Please be in prayer for them. I know I really want to thank you that uh, both my wife and I do for all of you who have been praying for Diane. Uh, she was going to come this morning, but uh, as it turned out, I, I've got things afterwards that I've got to do. I've got the welcome class and stuff, and I said, why don't you just take another week? But next week, she'll be here. Those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, lots of you know she had a, she had a terrible fall back in October when we were back east visiting concussion, the whole nine yards, and uh, she's really getting over all of that and uh, some of the anxiety that goes with it. So she had wanted to be here today, but probably next week she'll be there with me. So don't all descend upon her at once. <laughs> but I can't tell you how much Diane has appreciated your notes and your prayers. Thank you very much. Well, let me ask you to join us now as we pray and uh, as we conclude. Let's take a moment and it'll be quiet. You just bring things to the Lord <clears throat> and then I'll pray. Father, we come before you today <coughs> and we thank you for your incredible goodness to us. Thank you that we can come in a place like this and call this home and call this family and above all else to call you our brother, to call God our father. And we come now in this place this morning and so many in our church family are not doing well. Some are dealing with cancer, some are dealing with other issues, some are recovering from injuries, and we pray for their healing, Lord. Uh, I especially pray for Ellie Fisher today, and uh, it's been a long haul, um, that aneurysm in her brain, that, uh, the bleed, and Lord, I don't know what the outcome was. They were thinking about taking tubes out today, and... We don't know what the outcome of that was. We pray for her and especially for Jim, her husband. God, give comfort to him. I pray for Nadine Southern, Lord, that I just understood just recently of a cancer surgery that she had. And I pray for her healing, Lord. Um, many others on our list here. Uh, I think of Joanne Bader, Lord. She's in hospice. And uh, it's clear that you're calling her home soon. The other day when I saw her, there was such a, a joy on her. Uh, I thank you for that, but she's ready to meet you. I pray, Father, for her husband, Ed, that you'd give great comfort to him in this time. Lord, bless us now as we worship today and as we give our gifts to you, Lord. Let them come from hearts that just want to say to their Father in heaven, thank you for all of your gifts, and especially the gift of forgiveness and friendship with God. And we pray now as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And us from our nation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. That was a big job. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here today. You can't imagine how glad I am to be here. I didn't think I was going to make it, and I want to thank you for the prayers and the cards and everything. For some of you don't know, <clears throat> I finally had the big fall. You know, I was, went to stay with my daughter over Thanksgiving, and when we went to leave her house, we were all coming out the door, and it was my daughter, her husband, me and their two dogs. And it was kind of a race to see who was gonna get out first. 
Unfortunately, I won. <laughs> but I'm feeling much better. So it's just a matter of time. This song today is one of my favorite. I haven't had a chance to practice it much, but um, I know you've heard it many times. Many people have recorded it. It's just a, a wonderful thought. It's called In the Garden. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear The Son of God discloses And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me i am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known he speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds touch their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known I'd stay in the garden with him Though the night around me is falling But he bids me go Through the voice of woe My son to me is calling And he walks with me And he talks with me And he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Thank you. Did you see how I covered up that little mistake there? That was, that was cool. You probably hardly noticed it. <laughs> right here. Here we go. Thank you, Pat. Yeah. Thank you very much, Pat. Ah, oh, goodness. What a great morning. Don't you just love finally having sunshine outside? Yeah. Ah, Lord. Well, it is good to be here today and good to be with everyone. And I hope you're well and I hope you're healthy. And I hope you're grateful for the health God has given you, whatever it may be. Well, I want to come back to this series that I started a few weeks ago. It's about trying to share our faith, our friendship with God, with those around us. And we've been talking about how you can do that, because most of the time when we start tearing up, talking about sharing our faith, everybody gets a little uptight, sweaty palms, palpitating heart, you know, and we think we've got to, we've got to sell the gospel. First of all, I want to tell you something. You don't sell the gospel. It sells itself. It sells itself when people see how you behave. And you read the verse this morning. Absolutely, you know. And uh, people will ask you for a reason for the hope that's in you. 
and you do it with gentleness and with respect. But, uh, you know, we never have to sell Jesus at all. We just have to be willing to live our lives in his grace and give a reason for the hope that we have. And the key thing is, you're living such a life that you're, you're waiting for somebody to ask you, why, why are you different? Why are you happy? Why, I wish I had what you had. Oh, then you have the opportunity. But we've been talking about that. We've been talking about how you, we need to be aware of our neighborhood, aware of our people around us, and you know, what's their thinking? Where are they coming from? And lastly, we talked about listening. And, uh, you know, for some people, to be heard is to be loved because there are people that nobody's ever listened to. And you taking the time to listen to them may be the first time in their life they've ever felt worth something and someone cared. But I'm going to talk with another one, about another one this week, and that's about eating. First one's about being there, then, then listening, and then we could just say eating but it's sharing a meal in the name of Jesus. That's what we're going to talk about here this morning. And uh, we have a saying here, if you feed them, they will come. And I'll tell you, that is true in this church. Boy, I'll tell you. Just put it out there and they'll be there, you know. Uh, but I like another saying. It goes right along with that. And if you dine with them, he will come. And uh, Jesus is our guest and he is there and any time that we are eating and sharing a meal in the name of Jesus, I don't mean we just have to all of a sudden pray over these people, oh, in the name of Jesus, we're going to have this meal. I, I don't mean that. But we come in the name of Jesus because we know he's going to be there with us. When you look at the ministry of Jesus, you find that listening and eating with people was central to what he did. And we're going to look at that in a minute. Listening and eating go together like peanut butter and jelly. I'm not being sacrilegious. They do. Just, you know, it, 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 almost without thinking, listening and eating with people become part and parcel of how you, you share your faith. And it definitely was Jesus' way. Now, most of the time when we think about how Jesus ministered, we think of things like miracles. We think of his preaching and his teaching. We think of his prayers. We even think about casting out demons. But you know what? More often than not, what you see is Jesus eating with people. And it was definitely his way. And I want to look at that with you this morning. And as we do that, I hope we can glean some lessons out of this about how you can live and share your faith as you listen to people and you have a meal with them. Well, let's talk about it. Jesus enjoyed meeting and eating with people. That's just, I mean, you can't get away from that in the Gospels. First miracle was the wedding at Cana. And you remember that? In John chapter 2, he goes to the wedding at Cana, and it's a big wedding, and the worst thing that happened is they ran out of wine. Okay? Great juice. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, his mom comes to him and says, son, you've got to do something. It's just, you know, every once in a while you get a little glimpse of the, of the personal life, the family life of Jesus. And here's mom, Mary. Son, they just ran out of wine. Can you do something? And Jesus, so many words, is saying, what do you want, a miracle? <laughs> this is not my time. But, of course, he did. He changed the water to wine. But it was at a banquet, and he's there. The feeding of the 5,000 in, in the chapter 14 of Matthew, but in the very next chapter, he feeds another 4,000. I mean, food was central to Jesus can't send these people away without food. Oftentimes at Lazarus' house. Now, we're going to talk about Lazarus in a minute. And you know Lazarus was who Jesus raised. But the first introduction to him, we meet him in Luke chapter 10. This is what it says. It's a story of two sisters. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village, that was Bethany, where a woman named Martha opened her home to him, and she had a sister named Mary. No mention of Lazarus. We'll find out later. That's who, who you know, their brother was. And I, I read this first, and I thought it was kind of interesting. Now, later on, you're going to realize he's in Lazarus' home, but it almost makes it sound like Martha was the oldest, and maybe she's the one that invited Jesus to come on to our home, have a meal. But he's there, and they have a meal. Now, you, you know this passage. Mary sat at the Lord's feet. I think Mary was the youngest. 
Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. Mary, Mary was the theologically oriented sister, I guess, and Martha was the one who was always, you know, her last name wasn't Stuart, but it probably came close. <laughs> she, she, she's always thinking about the meal and taking care of things at the house. I, I'll give you a little glimpse of my wife, Diane, you know. When she says dinner's ready, and I'm oftentimes sitting in there on my computer, and I'm saying, okay, I got one last thing. Dinner is ready. <laughs> that means get there. I got a feeling Martha was like this. And, and of course, she, you know the passage, she got a little upset because Mary, she, said, she comes to Jesus and says, you know, she's not doing anything, and I'm doing all the work. And of course, Mary, Jesus said to her, Martha, 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 you're always worried about so many little things, but your sister really shows them the better thing, the things of the Lord, the things that are spiritual. Not to put Martha down, but he's saying to Martha, relax, gel, will you? That was his way of saying that. So we meet them, and he, said, he oftentimes went to their home. Then there's the raising of Lazarus, of course, and you know about that. In John chapter 11, Lazarus dies. And he gets word, and he comes there, and the sisters, both of them run out. They're just brokenhearted because it's six days after he's dead. And they said, Lord, if you'd only been here, my brother would not have died. And, of course, you know that in what ensued, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, and he that lives and believes in me, he'll never die. Do you believe this? And, of course, they did, and you know, Jesus raised Lazarus. Well, the next thing we read about is the meal after the raising. Six days later, just before Passover, we're getting down to countdown now, Jesus arrived at Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Once again, they're eating together. There's a meal. But if you know this passage, also you know that it was Mary. Mary, Mary, Mary was just always the one that was kind of oriented towards more spiritual things, I suppose. Maybe Martha's back there fixing dinner again. But Mary comes in with this ointment and begins anointing Jesus. And, of course, Jesus said, you don't know it, but this is anointing for my burial. Well, but again, it's mealtime. And then, of course, six days later, uh, the Passover comes. And when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. Now, when they reclined at the table, you see the picture of the Last Supper with Da Vinci, you know, and they're all sitting around a table, and you'll see pictures here today. They didn't sit at a table with chairs. Usually it was a little low table, and you kind of laid on the ground, and you ate there. Boy, I, I don't think I could have ever gotten used to that. Uh, anyway. But he says, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. What did Jesus, what did he most want in this moment? To be with his friends, to sit around the table. And he was about to tell them what it was all about. I love the statement of British theologian N.T. Wright. He said, when Jesus began to tell them of his impending death, <laughs> he did not give them theology. He gave them dinner. I like that. Eating a meal with his friends was crucial in the ministry of Jesus. Well, let's look at some more stuff. Interesting, the people that he oftentimes ate with, misfits and unfits, tax collectors. There just about wasn't anybody worse than this. And, of course, we looked at last week, we looked at um, um, Nick. It's one of those times when my name goes blank, just like you do. Um, Thank you. Thank you. I knew there's a reason I got you on staff over here. I knew it wasn't Lazarus. I knew it wasn't Nicodemus, and it was the Z that wouldn't come to me. I, I, this is a side, but I always learned years ago when I was doing baby dedications in our church, or baptisms, same thing, you know, I, I, I learned I got to take a list with me. One Sunday, I'm doing a baby dedication, and uh, the couple, you know, were really close friends of mine, and uh, they had an older a boy, Anthony, was probably three or four, and then little Nick was the newborn, but they wanted them both dedicated. And I'm standing up there, and I can remember Anthony's name, but for the life of me, when I'm talking about your baby, Nick, I can't remember it. And, you know, there's this dialogue going on inside of me as I'm going on, please, Lord, give me the name, would you? And I, every time I talk about that, I say, your son, your, your, your beloved son here, you know, now you've presented him for... It is your boy. Please, Lord. 
By a miracle of miracles, right at the end, God says, his name is Nicholas. Thank you. <laughs> That's extra, whatever, anyway. <laughs> but, but even Zacchaeus, you know, you remember the, the people hated the tax collectors. They were the worst that people thought of anyway. And then there, it says tax collectors and sinners. Well, sinners is kind of a catch-all term for just about everything that's base. From the prostitute to the murderer to the thieves to the insurrectionists, you name them, they all fall in that category of sinners. Well, Jesus ain't with them. Simon the leper, we don't, in the home of Simon the leper, rarely was a leper allowed to be in his home, but we don't know what the circumstances were. Maybe he was well-to-do, we don't know. But even with Simon the leper, his disciples with dirty hands. <laughs> One time the priest came to Jesus and said, what is this? You're eating with your disciples and they never wash up. And, and again, you know, washing before meal wasn't just hygienic. It just really had to do with their spiritual situation. That was his disciples. Rugged guys, didn't always wash their hands. Some of those disciples would probably never have gotten along in that upper room. It names them, at least two of them, Simon the Zealot and Matthew. Now, who are they? Simon the Zealot. It says Simon, and he's distinguishing him from Peter. Simon the Zealot was a guy that was followed zealots. Zealots were guys who lurked in the shadows, waited for a Roman legionnaire to come by, and then they would murder them. These guys were fanatical. This is who this guy was, but he found Jesus. But he's asked to be part of a group made up of one guy that used to collect taxes for the Romans. You can imagine the healing that must have gone through with these two guys. Disciples who wanted position. They all wanted position. John and James especially were two of his closest. Incidentally, they were his cousins. And they used to dicker about who was going to get to sit next to Jesus in the kingdom. To make matters worse, their mother, her name was Salome. And most biblical scholars think that she was a sister of Mary. And that means this is Auntie Salome. Let me read to you the passage. This is, I love this. There, there are such personal glimpses in the Bible every once in a while. You just have to look for them. But in the 20th chapter, then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling down, <laughs> she got on her knees and asked him a favor. What is it you want, he says? Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? Oh, we can. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink the cup, but to sit at my right or my left is not for you, not for me to grant you. This is Auntie Salome asking that. Well, he, he ate dinner with all kinds of people. Even the family was a little interesting sometimes. Even after his resurrection, he continued eating with people. The home of the two disciples. You remember this, the resurrection, and he's on that road to Emmaus, and he meets two guys that are disciples, and they don't recognize him. And then he's going to leave and say, no, 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 stay with us. Come, come have a meal. Come to our house. And at first Jesus didn't want to, but they insisted. And he came. And they ate together. And he began to tell them everything that had to happen. And all of a sudden, the, it's like the scales are lifted. And they realized, I'm eating dinner with Jesus. Let me tell you something. I said, if you, if you dine with them, he will come. You live the life you're supposed to live. And you, you share a meal with people. And sometimes with people that maybe needed somebody to share a meal with them. And somewhere in the course, as you live the life and you, you reflect Jesus in your demeanor, suddenly they're going to realize Jesus was here. Well, the first meeting in that upper room, I've got to believe there was food that night. They were hiding, and I don't think they were just up there for just a, a few moments. They were hiding, and there must have been food, and Jesus appeared. And then, this is one of my favorites, the fish fry up in Galilee. Do you remember this? This is uh, quite a bit later. And uh, all the disciples, you know, Jesus, Peter said, I'm going fishing. So they followed, and they went back up to Galilee, and they're fishing. And they're out there, and they're not doing very well, and Jesus is standing on the shore. He says, hey, guys, Hey, throw, the, throw it over here, you know? And all of a sudden, Peter recognizes who it is, and he jumps in the water, and he runs in, you know, and they all come in, and they have a fish fry. And you remember there in the last part of chapter 21, it's where Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? 
Three times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Had to have been calculated to remind Peter that you denied me three times. And every time Jesus said, good, go feed my sheep. Give them a meal. <laughs> the pattern of the early church was to eat together. In chapter 2, right after Pentecost, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And the believers were together, and they had everything in common. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Eating together was a big part of it. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Oh, I tell you, there's power when we dare to share a meal with people. But the enemy attacks. Satan doesn't like that. Maybe you remember this. In the sixth chapter, it says, when the number of the disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews, that means those who were out, born outside of Palestine and were back for the Passover and probably got saved while they were there, complained against the Hebraic Jews. These are the more purebreds because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. It was a big thing in Jewish culture that every day at noontime they would go out and collect alms and food so that those who were widows and less advantage they would always have a meal. And so the church carried it over into their practice. And the gist of it was that the, the Grecian Jews felt like we were just getting leftovers most of the time. <laughs> I love the way the King James puts it. It says, there arose a murmuring. Sounds like a modern-day church. <laughs> and you, if you know the passage, you know that the disciples got together and they said, this, this is no good. You know, They wanted the disciples to take care of the food. It's not good for us to just serve. We need to spend our devotion to the, to the word and to prayer, but we'll pick seven men among you, the first deacons. And they took care of serving the tables, making sure everybody got fed. And what was the result? In the seventh verse, it said, the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith, even priests. Food was a big deal. Eating together was a big deal. And not allowing it to become... A divisive thing. I know once in a while we run out of hot dogs when we have dinner. Be, be patient with us. There's chips. and no. We try to make sure we have enough for everybody. Anyway, okay, here's another. This, this, I love this one. Preaching and eating together can be dangerous for your health. What am I talking about? 20th chapter of Acts. I love this. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke until midnight. It was a long sermon. <laughs> Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus. Falling asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story. <laughs> I've heard of preaching, putting people to sleep, but I never saw anybody fall out of a window. window. And, uh, and three stories is quite a long way. And everybody ran down there. They were worried, sick, the poor guy's dead. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man, and put his arms around him. I don't know what he did. But he said, don't be alarmed, he's alive. And they got up and they went away. Then it says, they went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. <laughs> and then he talks until daylight. He's just getting started. But they're eating together. They're eating together. <sighs> then you remember 1 Corinthians 11. We read it every time we come to the Lord's table. Beware of sloppy potlucks. <laughs> Understand something, in the early church, what arose was what they called the love feast. And the, the, the believers would come together frequently. And they, kind of, kind of like a potluck, I guess we'd call it. Uh, I don't know how you say potluck in the Greek, which the New Testament was written in, but anyway, that was what it would be. And in the course of that meal, they then would partake of the Last Supper, the, the communion. What was happening in Corinth, Corinth was a pretty wealthy city. And uh, a lot of the believers who came to Christ there were from upper class. But there were others who were just workers, and they had to work later in the day. Bottom line, here's what was happening. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you're eating. For you eat. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. The gist of it was that the others who didn't have to work so late would come and they'd eat up all the food. And then the poorer ones who had to work later, they get there and there's hardly any food left. 
Oh, I've had that problem here a couple times. <laughs> and it, it became a divisive thing in the church. What's Paul say? So then, my brothers, when you come together, eat. Wait for each other. Wait for each other. Eating together is central to what we're doing here. Now, hospitality and eating, they create an atmosphere of forgiveness. In 1 Peter 4, in the 7th verse, Peter says, the end of all things is at hand. So here's what you need to be doing, among other things. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. He's talking about eating together. Caring for one another. Don't let anybody be left out. Hospitality and eating together ministers to people's needs. Share with God's people who are in need. Here's one of my favorites. Hospitality and a message from the boss. In Hebrews 13, the writer is writing to Jewish Christians. He says, don't forget to entertain strangers. That literally is, don't forget to show hospitality. For by doing, so doing, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. And what do you think he was thinking of when he wrote this to these Jewish believers? What, did he, what was he thinking they'd remember? Back in the Old Testament. Do you remember Sodom and Gomorrah? And when the three angels came down, one of whom was the angel of the Lord, probably the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, and they came down to Sodom, and, and Abraham took them into their house, his household, and they revealed what was going to happen. And they were, just, they were first identified as these strangers coming, but one of them is the Lord. And then he tells them, you've got to get out of the city, because I'll tell you what we're going to do. He had a message from the boss. Sometimes in the course of offering hospitality, people, we may be surprised who shows up. God may send you a message through somebody you've invited to dinner. Let me tell you what happened to me. I was, I'm going to think about this for a minute, 24 years old. No, I was 23. Boy, that's a long time ago. I was still in the Coast Guard. I was the engineering officer on a ship. And uh, my wife and I had been looking for a church. And uh, we, we, we had just moved into Long Beach. We hadn't been there very long. And uh, we went to a church and uh, kind of liked it. So what we did, uh, Diane had gotten saved in college at San Diego State University. And she hadn't been baptized. So... We, that Sunday, it was a large church, about 1,500 people. I'd never been anything that big. And I'd only been two or three times. So going out the door that Sunday morning, the pastor, Bill McElhaney, God bless him, I'll never forget him. I said, could you come over to the house and talk to my wife about baptism? He said, sure. Took down my address. The next night, Monday night, he came over. He didn't know me from Adam. He says to me, you know, we went through what the Bible had to say about baptism, and it's fine, Diane's going to be baptized. Then he says to me, and why he said this to me. He knew I was in the military. And uh, he said, what are you going to do when you get out of the military? I said, well, I'm, I'm not sure that I am. I said, I'm thinking about making a career out of it. Uh, I applied to go to graduate school, and, and they, got, they selected me to go to graduate school, so they would have paid everything. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking about career. He says, you ever think about the ministry? That, that God plays dirty. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, way yeah, I'd, I'd kind of on and off wrestle with this thing for about at that point, for about eleven years, somewhere around the age of twelve or thirteen, I first started thinking about it, and uh, but it just kind of is in the background, never. But I, I couldn't get rid of it. He says after he's going out the door that night, he says you ought to think about this. That was in uh, October of uh, 1969, and for the next three, four months, five months, until our, the ship I was on, we were going to Vietnam, and we left in February of the next year. And I would wrestle with it, and I'd put it out of my mind, and finally I just said to Diane, I said, I don't know, you know, I'm just, just God's going to have to handle this thing. I'm not. 
And um, sure enough, on the way over, I had six nights of no sleep. And I finally got out of bed one night and got on my out of my bunk and got on my knees and said, Lord, I'm scared to death. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. But if you want me going to the ministry, okay. Got back in bed and went to sleep. Thanks a lot, Bill McElhaney. <laughs> He's a stranger. We invited him. We even gave him something to eat that night. And he brings a message from the boss. You never know what God's going to do. We, we, we may think that we're, we're sharing a meal with people and, and we're doing them a benefit. You know what? God may be engineering you into the corner because he wants to get your attention. He wants you to do it the way Jesus did it. Well, that was an amazing night for me. Let me tell you, I'm going to wind this up now. Sitting down at a table with people and, and sharing a meal, it's just, it's the way Jesus did stuff. There's a church I was reading about the other day up in Seattle. It's called the Dinner Church. You've heard of the Dinner Theater over here? I mean, I, I don't know. I can't imagine going to a theater and having dinner there and then watching the movie, but that's, it's kind of an end thing. Well, they have what they call the Dinner Church. And so you go and you have dinner and you have church while you're doing dinner. You know, I used to think about this, and this church has spawned about 40 churches that way up there. And when I first read about that, I said, no, 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 I can't. I don't want to divide my worship time up with, with eating. Uh, but, you know, the more I thought about this whole thing, and, and most of these churches, if you ever go to, some of you probably have visited one if you went with your kids or your adult kids, you see a lot of this. They'd have the tall tables, and, and they'd all sit there. And on the back, you know, they'd have a barbecue and everything. I went to my daughter's church one time years ago uh, that she was attending, and it was a very young church. And, and they had all the food there in the back, and then you bring it in there and you sit down, uh, they also had earplugs for, the, for us older people. You know? yeah. <laughs> but, but anyway, as, as I thought about this, I used to think, no, this is not good. But then I started looking at what the early church did. Now, we're not going to have dinner in here. We always wait until later, okay? Uh, mostly because we don't want to have to clean up after you. But, uh, yeah. but, but think about that for a minute. They, they came, and, and it, it, eating a meal together and hearing the gospel and hearing the truths of Jesus. What a wonderful setting. So how can we do that? You're sitting there this morning. Well, does that mean I got I to gotta cook at home? I know a lot of you don't even like to cook at home. Okay? No, it doesn't have to be at home. If, if you enjoy doing it, it would be great. You've got neighbors all around you. Have them over. But you can have them in your home. You can go out to a restaurant. Have a picnic at the park. Ready-made for you is what we do here around the table in our lobby. I, I mean, you cannot get rid of you people on Sunday morning. Wow. I'll tell you, the greatest day in whole COVID was in year 2021 when we finally in October could start eating in here. Man, alive, you guys are here. Oh, it was wonderful, and we loved it. We, that was a special time in our church. But watch for people who might be alone. Invite them over to your table. Find out who they are. There is nothing like sitting down around a table and sharing a meal or a cookie and coffee, whatever it may be. Friendship Sundays. Among other reasons, if we do Friendship Sundays because it's just a great way to celebrate the family of God here, but it's a great way to make connections. And I tell you all the time, invite your friends. Just come. I used to say, come and just dress casual. You all dress casual all the time anyway. Doesn't matter. But just invite your friends. It's a perfect time for them to see the life of Jesus in his people. Movie nights, that's another one. Nothing wrong with movie nights. Because we eat together. It's all about sharing a meal with people. Well, I want you to think about this for a minute. Eating in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. That's the way the Bible begins. But you know the way the Bible ends? Well, first of all, sin and ruin came. That just blew the whole thing out of the water. But when we get to the end of the Bible, this is what the whole Bible's about. Then I saw a new heaven and new earth. If you understand what heaven is, you understand what the Bible's about, look at the bookends. But in the middle of it, I want you to recognize something. When God created, he said, out of the ground, 
made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And then sin ruined it. Added calories, added cholesterol. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know about that, but... But God has a new menu. The marriage supper of the Lamb. And he invites all of us. And he sends out an RSVP. So you gotta you gotta reserve. You gotta tell him you're coming. He wants to know if you're coming. Revelation 3:20. What's he say? I stand at the door and I knock. If anybody answers, I will dine with them and they with me. That's his invitation to all of us to come to his table. And when you do it here and you share a meal with people, you're giving them a little taste of heaven. What did Jesus say? Taste. If you're thirsty, come and drink. Taste and know that I am good. Come to me and I will give you rest. Your sins I will remember no more. Everybody is a friend at my table, Jesus says. Everybody ought to be a friend at ours. I want you to bow with me out for a moment this morning. Thank you for putting up with my stories this morning. I, I love this study. When I first got into this thing, I thought, oh, you know what? Just by the way, there's not that much about meals. I couldn't believe how much I found. And, and the humor and, 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 and the humanity and the realness that's there. So this morning, bow with me for a moment. Let's talk to the one who dines with us. Lord Jesus, we come today and, and thank you for dining with us. Today, I pray, if there's somebody here that's lonely, they're looking for hope, they're looking for family, they're looking for connection, they're even looking for friendship with God. Let them know today that if they'll just answer the door, you'll come in. And you will dine with them and they with you. But Lord, help us as a church to be the best advertisement for your menu. It's a menu in which if we're thirsty, we can drink. If we're hungry, we can taste. And we'll discover that indeed, Lord, you are good. You will forgive. You will cleanse. And you will make us your own. Somebody like that today, help them just to reach out and say, Lord, I want to come to dinner with you. And show them immediately how to get there. Bless us, Lord, as we go from this place now today. May it good be good to have been in the house of the Lord. And may we know that indeed you are good. You are our friend. And nothing is beyond the forgiveness of God. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together this morning. We're going to sing a song. Where he leads me, I will follow. It says, I can hear my Savior calling. Take the cross and follow me. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll tell you where he's leading us. He's leading us to dinner. He's leading us to invite whoever we can find. Come, dine with the Master.
normally I don't do this. Normally I would start and pray, but I, we just got the meat of a message. We can get to have dessert outside when we leave. And I know most of you really love that. So get out there and enjoy it and stay as long as you want. Uh, <laughs> let, let, let's pray. Father, we're thankful for the message today. We're thankful for the fact that uh, we're reminded that by fe through fellowship, that we see Jesus. Through fellowship, we see the truth and the love of the gospel. So Father, help us remember that. Help us enjoy each other. Help us fellowship together truly with the love of the gospel in our hearts. And we pray all that in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. amen.